The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 39 Esben Flavogel, The Factory Tool. All night, Janner stood at the long table and cut metal. Whenever he glanced up, he caught sight of shapes swinging from chains, from rafter to rafter like bugs. The maintenance managers were everywhere, supervising the tools as they worked. Sometimes an actual fork made it to the pairing station, which reminded him that he hadn't eaten in hours, nor had he had anything to drink. The hot air of the factory floor sucked the liquid from every pore and left his tongue dry as a dead leaf. Janner's hands ached. He had done his share of work with rakes and shovels and knew well the feeling of a blister forming beneath the skin. If his hands hadn't been covered in soot, he would have seen the red spots that would soon swell and fill with fluid. He was glad Tink had been spared this fate. Whenever his eyes drooped, he shook his head and pinched himself to keep awake. As he struggled to close the scissors on a sliver of stubborn metal, he thought of his sweet mother, her strong, easy way of giving him affection and comfort. While he ground the handle of a blade, he thought of Poto's booming voice, of Oscar's flop of hair. When he tossed the reworked pieces into a barrel, he thought of Lily's curious calm and the magic in her songs. And when he bent forks, he thought of Tink's insatiable appetite. Even as the memories of his families kept him company, they made his heart heavy and lonesome. It was a miserable night. At dawn, Mobrick appeared. Janner looked down at the little creature blankly, realizing that in a few short hours he already looked and acted like the other exhausted children of the factory. He had to escape, and soon, but for now, all he wanted was a bed and something to eat. Follow me, child! The overseer needs to ask you a few questions! Mobrick led Janner back down the long hallway and into the big, empty room. They crossed to the door on the far wall, and Mobrick knocked. They entered an office with a large desk where the overseer sat, still wearing his black top hat. He smiled, yawned, and patted the whip that lay coiled on the desk. Forgive me, he said. I just woke from a delightful night's sleep. My bed is so soft, you see, and large. I trust you found your work enjoyable. The parrying station affords much movement and variety, I believe. Janner was now fully awake. He wanted to leap across the table and knock the silly hat from the overseer's head. He wanted to haul the man downstairs and make him pair the bad blades for an hour. But most of all, he wanted the man to open the portcullis and let him go. Let them all go. Now, said the overseer, dipping a quill into a bottle of ink, I need your full name in case your parents ever find replacements for you. Janner paused, remembering the punch in the stomach the last time he spoke to the overseer. Oh, it's all right, said the man. You're allowed to tell me your name. Janner cleared his throat. My name is Esben. Esben Flavogel. The overseer scratched it into his ledger without bothering to ask how, to, how it was spelled. There. Mulbrook, show the tool to his bunk. Below the main factory floor, where the furnaces roared, lay a dormitory. Bunk beds lined the walls. Janner saw hundreds of children, each snoring in a deep sleep or climbing wearily out of bed to face another day in the factory. No one spoke or laughed or even made eye contact. Mobrick allowed Janner a drink of water from a cistern, then pointed him to an empty bunk and left. The mattress was lumpy, but far more comfortable than the sandy floor of the burrow. Janner realized as he drifted away that he hadn't slept in a proper bed since the day the fangs had ransacked the Igby cottage. In Pete's castle, he had been quite comfortable on the pile of blankets and animal skins spread on the floor, but it hadn't been a bed. Since then, he had slept on the hard ground every night. As he drifted to sleep, he felt the inside of his swollen lip with his tongue and wondered if his tooth would still wiggle in the morning. When he woke, he smelled food, but it wasn't the smell that woke him. A bell clanged and clanged and clanged, and it was several moments before Janner was awake enough to realize that a boy beside his bed was making all the racket. The boy had pudgy cheeks and wore a tattered red cap that seemed about to slide off the back of his head. All right, all right, Janner snapped, pushing the bell away from his ear and sitting up. Time for breakfast, tool, said the boy, and he marched off to annoy someone else. 
The dorm room was busier than it had been that morning when Jenner collapsed into bed. Children pulled on boots, washed their faces with water from a trough, and sat at a long wooden table, spooning a watery broth into their mouths. The bell clangor made his rounds, but otherwise there was very little speaking. These children's spirits had been broken. Who knew how long they had toiled in the factory? Some were old enough to have whiskery fuzz on their chins, and others were barely as old as Lily. Janner couldn't understand why the overseer used only children for the labor. Couldn't an adult work longer and faster? Janner sat at the table, and a boy placed a bowl and spoon before him along with a cup of water. No one looked at him. No one spoke. The only sound was the chorus of hungry slurps from the twenty or so children at the table. Janner cleared his throat. Hello. He waited for an answer. A few of the children glanced at him but kept eating without a word. My name's Esben. Esben uh, Flavogel. Just got here. We can see that, said the boy directly across from him. The boy raised his bowl to his mouth and sucked up the last drops of soup. You'll find there's not much to talk about after a while. What's your name? It doesn't matter. I'm a tool just like you. Janner rolled his eyes. I'm not a tool. The boy shrugged and left the table. Janner turned his attention to his soup. It didn't look very appetizing, but his mouth watered. He picked up a spoon, but fiery pain shot across his hand, and he sucked air through his teeth. Blisters. They cracked and oozed on every finger and all across his palms. Gingerly, he picked up the spoon again and ate his soup in silence, surprised to find that it was quite delicious. He was also surprised that when he finished his soup, the serving boy appeared with a fresh bowl and removed his empty one. Janner devoured the second bowl and then the third, so famished that he forgot the pain in his hands. When he was finished, he got up from the table, not sure what to do or where to go. Back in the pairing station, tool, said a voice from behind him. Mobrick, the ridge runner, stood at his elbow. Jenner was strangely glad to see him. It's my job to make sure the new implements learn the system. You eat soup, then you wash your face. Then you head back to the factory floor to do your job. Understand? I guess so. Then go, Mobrick said, turning away. Then he stopped and said, I nearly forgot. These should fit you. He reached into a pocket of his suit coat and tossed a pair of thick leather gloves to Janner. Mobrick, wait. Thank you. I need to ask you something. Do you have any fruit? Mobrick asked. No. The ridge runner walked away. Janner saw several maintenance managers leaning against the wall watching him and took a deep breath. He would escape. He just had to wait until they weren't watching him so closely. Maybe later that day, once they saw he could work fast, they would forget him long enough that he could break away and get out. The pairing station, then, Janner said to himself. I hope Tink is faring better than I am. Another hot, miserable night passed on the factory floor. Another night of blasting heat, roaring flames, creaking wheels, and painful hands. Janner spent the first several hours thinking of his family, but that proved too saddening. Then he thought about his thags and about the books he had recently read. He recalled the characters from the stories, the settings, the themes of the books. But his mind kept slowing to a thoughtless sludge, a world where all that mattered was the hiss of the machines and the cutting of metal. Whenever his table of misshapen blades and forks was close to empty, but never completely empty to his great frustration, a child appeared with another full wheelbarrow. Whenever Janner attempted conversation with the child, they never answered or met his eyes. He wanted to grab their faces and force them to look at him, to acknowledge his presence, to act as if they were still human. At last, a pure yellow light crept in through the windows near the ceiling. It diffused their orange-red glow of the furnace fires and torches, catching the heat-choked air of the factory. Dawn. A maintenance manager appeared and said, Shift's over, tool! Janner, covered in sweat and soot, dropped the shears to the floor. He staggered past the machines to the dormitory stair, pushed through the double doors, past the crew of sleepy-eyed children on their way to their stations, and collapsed on his bunk without bothering to eat. He woke to the clanging of the bell beside his ear. It was the same boy with the same satisfied grin on his face. Janner ate two bowls of soup, carefully pulled his gloves over his blistered hands and trudged out the doors and up the stairs to the pairing station. 
He couldn't imagine spending another day in the factory. His hands hurt. His back was tired. He hadn't seen the sun in days. He missed his family desperately. And most of all, he could feel his mind shrinking. There was nothing to talk about, laugh about, or think about except the machines. Every child who crossed his path frightened Janner more because he knew that if he remained in the fork factory for long, he too would forget who he was. His eyes would glaze over. He would pass his days in mindless repetition, never thinking, never dreaming, forgetting what a wide, bright world lay outside. On the third night of Janner's captivity, he made a decision. He arrived at his station, picked up the heavy shears, and looked around for the maintenance managers. He saw one pacing a platform that hung from the ceiling. The boy stopped and leaned over to bark at an order at some child or other on the side nearest the machines. When Janner was sure the maintenance manager wasn't looking, he took a deep breath, looked around one last time, and ran for his life. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book 2 North or Be Eaten Chapter 40, The Coffin Janner was aware of some movement behind him, probably the maintenance manager calling for help, but as long as it stayed behind him, he didn't care. He darted between machines, noting with some satisfaction the looks of surprise on the children's faces as he passed. It was the nearest he had seen any of them come to looking alive. The factory floor was a maze of metal and fire, and after only a few moments, Janner realized he was lost. He had thought it would be easy to find the stair that led to the double doors that led to freedom, but the machines in the aisles of tables and crates disoriented him. He heard more yelling from every direction now. Janet felt an abrupt increase in temperature and rounded a corner to find himself staring at the grim black face of the main furnace. A boy several feet away used a long metal pole with a hook on one end to pull open the hot grate, while another child shoveled a serving of coal into its belly. The fire blazed and roared its hungry thanks. The two children looked at Janner with confusion, but he finally had his bearings. He remembered seeing the furnace and the piles of coal when he and Mobrick had first entered the long hallway. Janner spun and saw the double doors and the stairway that led to them not far away. With the heat of the furnace bright on his back, he ran as straight as he could for the stairs, weaving in and out of machinery, but aiming always for the doors. At last, he reached the stairs and risked a look behind him. Five boys, taller and older than Janner, pushed their way toward him, in no great hurry. Two more boys swung from the chains that hung from the ceiling. Janner had no idea what he was doing. He knew that at the end of this long hallway was the big, empty room where the carriage waited. He knew the overseer had a whip, and Mobrick said he wasn't afraid to use it. He knew the only certain exit from the building was through a heavy portcullis he couldn't open alone. But he also knew he couldn't stand another day at the pairing station without doing something. He wasn't a tool. He was the throne warden of Anaria, which meant that though they might capture him, he wouldn't go quietly. As he ran up the stair, he heard something that startled him so badly he nearly fell. Janner Igby, don't. A girl stood at the bottom of the steps. She was filthy, but her eyes were like pearls in the mud, large and luminescent. It was the same child he had seen the day he arrived, the one he thought he recognized. How do you know my name? Janner asked. Every moment the maintenance managers came closer, but he couldn't make himself move. Who are you? Her bright eyes filled with tears that streaked her face like white paint on a black canvas. He had to go. If he was fast enough, he might have a few minutes to search for a way out before the overseer was alerted. Janner, you can't get out the girl said. Please don't run. Her voice was sweet and desperate and beautiful, a silver stream in a dark forest. Only such a voice could have stopped him from running. Janner looked at the doors behind him, then at the gang of maintenance managers pushing toward him, and then at the girl with the bright eyes, and he gave up. Part of him screamed, run, get out, but something stayed his feet. The first of the tall boys arrived at the bottom of the stairs, shoved the girl aside, and ascended. Janner didn't take his eyes from her, even when the maintenance managers punched him in the gut or twisted his arm behind his back. Her eyes were stars on a stormy night, pinpricks peeking through a, bri peeking through a break in the clouds. Janner felt a knee in his back and tumbled down the stairs head over heels. 
wondering dimly what it would sound like when his bones snapped. He crashed to the floor, dizzy with pain. Then he found her eyes again. Who are you? He breathed. Before the maintenance managers dragged him away, she leaned close. Sarah Cobbler, she said. See Book One, page nine. Footnote one. Then someone punched Janner and the stars went out. When Janner woke, he thought for a moment that he was dead. His eyes were open, but he could see nothing. His body ached and his hands were so blistered that he couldn't move his fingers. He tongued his swollen lip and tasted blood. He was in bad shape. But where was he? He lay on a hard surface, but his hands and feet weren't bound, which was a relief. He sat up and his forehead smashed into something hard. Ow! He put a hand to his forehead, forgetting the blisters on his fingers and palms. Ow! He said again. When the pain subsided, he found he was in a box not much wider than his shoulders and not much taller than his chest. He felt himself on the verge of panic. Janner had always been afraid of tight places, even when it was just he and Poto wrestling. Sometimes when Poto held his arms down, the same panic erupted. One moment, Janner would be laughing, and the next he lost all control and thrashed as if in a bad dream. He closed his eyes again and forced himself to breathe slowly but he couldn't resist the urge to push on the ceiling just to see if it would give. He pushed, found it solid and strong, and then he lost his mind. Janner screamed and scratched at the walls and ceiling of the box, heedless of the pain in his hands or in his fingernails when they tore away. He was trapped in a dark so deep that light itself seemed never to have existed at all. He lost all sense of time. He kicked and scraped until his strength was spent and then lay there sobbing. He cried for ages until sleep came at last, but he dreamed of a giant nothingness, an empty hole into which he tumbled and disappeared. When he woke again, he found that the box was not an awful dream, but a black reality. He panicked again. He lay panting in the blackness, talking to himself, praying aloud to the maker, accusing, pleading, screaming things that, while no one could blame poor Janner for saying them, will not be repeated here. And the maker's answer was a hollow silence. Hours and hours passed. Janner wept again, a different weeping than before. These tears were not from fear, but from weariness and a vast loneliness. He wanted to feel the touch of Naya's hand on the back of his neck. He wanted to hear Lily's voice, Tink's laughter. He wanted the musty smell of Poto's breath after he smoked his pipe. He wanted to see Pete the Sock Man's eyes, because the same stuff that made his father swam there. Those thoughts floated in his mind like dandelion seeds in a warm wind. Janner saw himself in his mind's eye, sitting in the field beside the Igby cottage. The long winter had passed. New green shoots sighed up from the furrows in the garden. Bright leaves as soft as a baby's feet shone on the trees. Then... As kind as his mother's kiss, the sun broke through and poured light upon his skin. In the black coffin, his hands cut and bleeding, his face bruised from the fists of the maintenance managers, Janner slept. His sleep was sound, untroubled by dreams of fangs or nag the nameless or the terrible, wheeling blackness. The next time he woke, he was aware of his hunger and thirst. Even amidst the terror of his first hours in the box, he had assumed this was a punishment not a long execution, but now he wondered if they meant to starve him or if they had he, or if he had been buried alive. Maybe he wasn't in the factory at all, but some cemetery somewhere deep in the ground. He was too tired to cry anymore, too tired to panic. So he lay there and thought about Sarah Cobbler and her beautiful eyes. Sarah Cobbler, he said aloud, enjoying the sound of her name. Why was it so familiar? She had known his name but he had never been to Dugtown. How would she know his name? Then he remembered. Sarah Cobbler, the girl who had been taken by the black carriage. Janner shook his head in the darkness, trying to remember. He had met a family at the Dragon Day Festival the year before, and they had had a little girl the same age as him. It was only a brief meeting, but Janner had made the mistake of mentioning to Tink that he thought she was pretty. Tink made fun of him for the rest of the day. Later, Naya told Janner and Tink she had been taken by the carriage. 
But the black carriage took children to Fort Lamardron, then to the Castle Throg, like the nursery rhyme said, at Castle Throg across the span, you'll weep at how your woes began, the night the carriage found you. Why was she here? How many of these children have been taken by the carriage? How many of their parents assumed they were lost forever? They were only a few miles away in Dugtown. If they knew their children were here, guarded only by the overseer, surely they would stop at nothing to tear the walls down and bring them home. Then he remembered the hags and beggars of Tilling Court. Many of the parents knew exactly where their children were, and it had driven them mad. Janner wanted more than ever to be in the ice prairies among brave men and women, not content to live under the thumb of the fangs. He ached to live in a world where fangs dared not enter. Maybe, when he was older, he would join Gammon's force and be part of the resistance. He would wield his sword and fight alongside the Screans when the time came. And if they could drive the fangs from Scree, then why not Anaria? And if they could drive them from the Shining Isle and restore his father's kingdom, well, his brother's kingdom, then why not attack Throg itself? Why not put an end to Nag and the trolls and the fangs and every enemy that would beat a 12-year-old boy and lock him in a coffin? Janner laughed. It was easy to have daydreams about conquering the world for the good of air we are. It was another thing to do it. He couldn't even make it from Glipwood to Dugtown without nearly dying, maker knows how many times. They had lost Pete. They'd lost Nugget. They had been captured by Stranders, chased by Fangs, betrayed, beaten, lost. And he had no idea what had become of Tink or the others. Janner's stomach curled. How long would they wait at the burrow? How long before they gave up on him and went on to the ice prairies? How could they possibly find him? Before such thoughts from his mind, he had to get out. That was the only thing to be done. Janner's mind worked this way for hours until he realized with a smile that he was no longer afraid of the darkness or the coffin. He was afraid of starving to death, but he doubted they would let him die, not after all the trouble the overseer went through to find children for his factory. As if in answer to this last thought, a sound came from outside the box. The first thing Jenner had heard, other than his own voice, since he had found himself there. Footsteps approached. A clicking sound. Mm, then the top of the box swung open and light stung his eyes. Out, oh, has been Flavogel. The overseer wants to see you. Hello, Mobrick, Jenner rasped. Unable to believe he was doing so, Janner sat up and entered the world again. Janner forced his stiff body out of the box. The room was small and dungeon-like, with stone walls and a squat ceiling. Chains hung from hooks on the wall, and bones lay in piles in the corners. Two coffins lay side by side, open and awaiting their next occupants. One day there wouldn't be any more occupants, Janner thought. Gammon and his army would sack Dugtown and every other evil place in Scree, and when he did, Janner swore to find this place and tear it down forever. No more children in coffins or in factories or in black carriages. No more. Janner looked at Mobrick with fire in his eyes. The ridge runner took a step backward and eyed the door, clearly not used to children emerging from the coffin undefeated. Janner Wingfeather had gone in unconscious and had come out more awake than ever. He considered seizing the Ridge Runner and throwing him into the box. He knew he could if he wanted, but it didn't feel right just yet. He had to be careful when and how he took action. No more running blindly through the factory. He would wait and watch and plan. Let's go, Janner said. The Overseer's waiting. Uh -huh.